I'm William Rim, and today we're on Palace Green, and specifically in the Cousins Library. Now, very few people know that Durham has one of the most remarkable archive collections of any university in the country. I would say it's a hidden gem of Durham, really, and uh, this is thanks to this man here, Bishop Cousin. So we're here in the Cousins Library to look at the special collections of the university, some of the amazing rare books, and then we're going to go to the Barker Research Library, which many of you may be familiar with, um, to look at some of the manuscripts that relate to the earliest years of the university, and so we can learn a little more about the history of Durham. So, without any further ado, let's get into it. So Cousins Library is quite unique in this part of the world. We think it is the earliest public library in North East England. When we say public library, we actually mean a very small group of learned men, people who'd gone to university to study uh, theology or law. This is Danielle, the, uh, the rare books curator here at the Cousins Library. She's one of the most knowledgeable people on the life of Bishop Cousins and the collection which she founded. Cousins Library was uh, created in 1669 by Bishop John Cousin, who is the first Restoration Bishop of Durham. Cousins Library is quite special for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, um, the fact that it is a public library, it still survives, it still survives in its original location. It is also one of the very first libraries in this country with wall-mounted bookcases. One of the other innovations in this library is the use of portraits around the room above the bookcases. Now, none of these portraits at the moment are in their right locations. However, originally, all these portraits were meant to um, indicate the subjects that were shelved underneath the portraits. So, for example, uh, we've got the portraits here of Erasmus, of Scaliger, and Hugo Grotius. Um, they were philologists, so there were people interested in language, um, they were humanists, kind of multitaskers, if you like. The portraits that you see here in the library today were actually taken from a number of books that are still in the library. And one of these is André TV uh, Poutreture. And as you can see, we've got uh, Erasmus here proudly on this page, and we've got it above the bookcase. You can see why Cousin wanted to construct this library here on Palace Green, because it is the centre of the power of the bishops of Durham. On the one hand you have the castle, on the other hand you have the cathedral, the medieval exchequer building is right beside it. He also built almshouses and um, basically wherever you look on Palace Green you can see the signs of Cousin's building activities. So Cousin got his ideas for his library while he was in exile in Paris. When the civil war started, um, Cousin had to flee the country because he was very much a royalist and he was very high church, high Anglican. And neither of those two things were, um, were popular uh, in the Cromwellian period. So Cousin spent nearly two decades in Paris. And this was at the same time that you get uh, public libraries opening up. These were libraries collected by private individuals, statesmen, cardinals, and they deliberately invited people in to share their knowledge. And Cousin clearly liked this idea because he did something very similar here in Durham. So for some context, the cathedral was finished in the early 12th century, several hundred years before Bishop Cousins came around. Shakespeare was writing around the turn of the 17th century, so about a few decades before Bishop Cousins. Now, the Bishop of Durham was one of the most powerful bishops in the country, and he ruled quite a lot of the area around him. The cathedral, the castle, and all of these buildings belonged to the, uh, the Bishop of Durham. When the university was created, most of the old bishop's lands went to the university. So when the university was founded in 1832, Cousins Library became part of the university, and this was, going, this was the ceremonial heart of it. Um, so uh, people were examined here, uh, matriculation happened here, as well as graduation. And the gallery is in fact uh, a late introduction to this space. And um, it was introduced by the early, early university to accommodate all the people that came to witness their sons graduating, for example. 
So this is the Cousins Library. Um, I do honestly believe it's one of the hidden gems of Durham. It's, it's an amazing space and it is open to everyone, so very much worth a visit. Next we are going to go to the Barker Research Library to look at some manuscripts. Welcome to the Barker Research Library. and We have here a, a um, selection of some of the books that are found in the Durham Archives collection. So, Danielle, would you like to talk th um, through a few of the books that we have here? Um, this, this, to start with, the binding is, is very noticeable already. It is. Um, it's actually quite an unusual binding in that mm -hmm. it's only half covered with, uh, with leather, mm -hmm. in this case pig skin. Um, the rest of the board is, is plain wood. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, um, it's a typical style of German bindings mm -hmm. of the early 16th century. Okay, so is this what I, I gather is an incunable? Uh, so, an incunable is uh, is any work printed before 1501. Mm -hmm. It's basically to, to um, note the first 50 years of mm -hmm. printing. Okay. Um, that didn't mean that on the 1st of January 1501 mm -hmm. bookmaking mm -hmm. changed. It, it, it is a completely arbitrary okay. date. So these are um, six short works, religious works, which um, possibly the first owner mm -hmm. of these works has put together. They were all printed mm -hmm. in Leipzig in the same area, so possibly the binding is, is from that mm -hmm. area as well. And what's really interesting um, is that um, the owner has also asked for little leather tabs to be mm -hmm. inserted to mark yes. the start of Amazing. each of the... Um, wow each of the items. Okay. Now, to my understanding, this is a book of ours, um, mm. which I've, I've studied little of, and, um, and so can you talk about this specific example, how it, it came to be in our collection? And um, This is one we, uh, I think we purchased not long mm. ago, uh, only a few years ago. It is um, a 15th century French mm -hmm. book of hours. Um, it was probably commissioned by a, a male mm -hmm. um, patron, and one of the really interesting things about mm. books of hours is that patrons often have themselves mm. depicted within mm. the book in, in one of the full page mm. illustrations. Um, and then it later passed into the hands of uh, a female owner mm -hmm. who added additional prayers okay. at the end of the text. Amazing. Um, and she was probably also the one who um, had the binding commissioned because the binding is, is much um, newer than yes, okay. the Book of Hours itself. That's very true. So for some context, the Book of Hours was a religious text that um, was very popular in the medieval period. It was designed to help you get to heaven and uh, minimise the time in purgatory. So it's, it was a very important book in a lot of people's lives. Next is this, so can you explain what this is? Yeah, it's, it's actually one of my favourites. Um, it is a slightly messy copy of the first subject catalogue mm -hmm. of Cousins Library. So this was written around 1670. Mm -hmm. um, it lists all the books that were in Cousins Library at mm -hmm. the time, so it's a really important historic document. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you, can, you can tell that it is a work in progress. Mm -hmm. So it's very sloppy handwriting, there's crossing out. Um, it's, it's basically to help um, find the books on the mm -hmm. shelves. So the portraits were one way of, of mm -hmm. finding books on the shelves. Mm -hmm. The subject catalogue was another Amazing. way. So at this time, Cousin was, um, was frequently ill and he wasn't always able to come to Durham. So a lot of the building work he had to supervise from a distance, um, not always mm -hmm. to his satisfaction, unfortunately. So the letters reveal him to be a slightly um, micromanagerial <laughs> nitpicker. Um, it, was, <laughs> it, it, does, it does happen. The subject catalogue was, was a bone of contention. Mm -hmm. um, it, didn't, it didn't progress quickly enough. Mm -hmm. um, it was done by cousin's son-in-law, okay. um, and he clearly was wasn't making enough progress. He was right. And finally, I was going to ask about mm. the binding. Um, yeah. And so, um, my understanding is this is a vellum binding. That's um, right. Can you explain quickly what vellum is? Um, um, so, vellum is um, is calf skin. Um, so, there's a difference between vellum and parchment. Mm. It's quite durable. It's really tough. So the book itself is uh, a late 19th century printing mm -hmm. um, by the press, the Kelmscott Press, which was set up by William Morris, mm -hmm. who was kind of the founder of the arts and crafts movement. Um, and with the Kelmscott Press, he was really keen to, uh, dem to kind of demonstrate and, and, and promote mm -hmm. um, hand press printing. Mm -hmm. So these are limited editions, um, and it often says in the back, mm -hmm. you know, this is number such and such of 500. Um, they are um, they're really well made. Um, 
and they're often they often cover medieval subjects. Okay. This particular text was written by William Morris himself wow, and um, printed after his death okay. in, in, in a kind of commemoration. Mm -hmm. Interesting. To my understanding, there are a few books in the um, in the archives which are not in quite such good shape, and mm. one of the most famous is the Shakespeare Folio. Now we can't see this t um, today, sadly, because it is it is not in an appropriate condition to um, to um, get out and look at. But um, there is a fascinating story behind it. It was very sadly stolen a few decades ago, and uh, but thankfully was returned. So would you would you like to discuss a little bit of? That? Um, so it's not something that I want to discuss in a huge amount mm -hmm. of detail, but it is the 400th anniversary mm -hmm. of the publication of the first folio, mm -hmm. 1623, um, only a few years after after Shakespeare's mm -hmm. death. Um, the uh, Durham copy, um, most people will have heard mm -hmm. about um, it, its temporary disappearance from yes. Durham and its return. Um, we are looking this year at uh, ways in which we can make Mm -hmm. our copy of the first folio more accessible mm -hmm. to people again. So, as you mm -hmm. say, at the moment, we can't mm -hmm. produce it for anybody. Yeah. Um, so we're looking at ways in which we can make okay. sure that it can be enjoyed mm -hmm. by everybody okay. again. Thank you. So I'm with Jonathan, the university archivist, whose job it is to look after all these amazing documents. Um, not a bad job, I'd say. Um, Certainly not. So, um, to start, this, if I'm not very much mistaken, is the foundation document of the university. Is, is that right? It is. It is the 1837 Royal Charter. Mm -hmm. um, it's not the Act of Parliament, which, of course, was um, from 1832. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting. You've got this disparity between when the, uh, when the foundation of the university was in 1832 and, of course, when this Royal Charter was issued in 1837. Mm -hmm. Um, and this charter essentially allowed um, Durham, Durham University graduates to, um, to, to be conferred with, with degrees. Okay. And there's, there's quite a long time scale between 1832 and 1837. And the reason for that, part of the reason for that was because there was opposition from um, Lord John Russell, who at this time was Home Secretary. Um, he didn't like the idea that um, that university was, was exclusively giving degrees to Anglicans. Um, he thought that should be open to, to all denominations. And eventually, thanks to the, um, the input of Bishop Edward Maltby, he managed to, to push it through and, and the uh, Act was passed in, in June 1837. Amazing. So in the same spirit, was, um, was the Bishop of Durham very involved in the early years of the university and in, in representing it in Parliament? In yes, yeah, so the, the original Bishop of Durham that was involved in, in, in the establishment of, of um, the university was Bishop William Van Mildert. Mm -hmm who was the last Prince Bishop of Durham. And um, he, he was very influential alongside uh, Archdeacon Charles Thorpe um, in, in founding the university and establishing the university. Um, he died in 1836. Um, Edward Maltby took over as Bishop of Durham, and he was res responsible for the um, for the um, negotiations with with Lord John Russell to um, to get this charter issued. So, do we have any indication for the students who couldn't graduate initially? Um, do we have any indication what their responses were and how they they managed that? I think there was a lot of um, criticism within the local press, mm -hmm. and there was, there was a lot of debate going back and forward between whether Durham was allowed to, to issue conferred degrees onto, um, onto uh, um, to, to students. I'm, I'm not absolutely certain what the students' responses were. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think they're necessarily recorded in, in the archive, unfortunately. Okay. Thank you. Um, and so, obviously, students were studying in Durham as part of um, the religious element mm. for a long time before 1832. And so, I suppose, can one say that, that Durham University was in fact founded a lot earlier, just not in the name of it? So it was, did it act like a university? It, 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 was, it wasn't necessarily founded in, the, um, in, in, in an earlier period. So it was founded, I would say the foundation date is 1832. Mm -hmm. But there are precursors to Durham before this date, and they date uh, from the 13th century. Uh, Durham Abbey was sending, um, sending monks to uh, what was called Durham Hall in Oxford. Oxford University, and, uh, and which then they became Durham College, um, and so there was there was this link between Durham and, and Oxford um, at the stage that what the foundation of the, un the university hadn't taken place. So there were attempts in the um, in the in the 16th and 17th century to set up, to f set up a, a northern university. Um, Henry VIII and um, and Oliver Cromwell respectively tried but but failed mm -hmm. and uh, so I think I think it's fair to say that the foundation date was 1832. Okay. Thank you. 
So for our second document, um, we're looking at a matricula um, from 1896. Now, I have very fond memories of signing the matricula on behalf of Hillby College, but um, this is a particularly special matricula, not only because it contains the name of every student, as was, I believe, the case until the 1960s, but it's also it's the first matricula that has a woman's name in it. So would you uh, like to explain um, her history and how how she was received by her uh, contemporaries? Yes, certainly. So this is, this is the signature here is, uh, reads Martha Ann Thomas, student in arts. Um, Martha was the, uh, the first um, uh, female Durham student to, to take a degree in, in arts. Before this time, in 1870, or from 1870, um, women were able to take um, qualifications in science in Newcastle in the Durham College of Science, mm -hmm. which was part of Durham University at this time. Um, but they weren't able to, to matriculate properly, they weren't able to take degrees, and so this is, this is the, first, the first famous student who was able to, to do that. Okay. And do we know anything about her time at Durham and how she was received? It's it's not possible. It's not been possible to identify uh, or to to ascertain exactly what it is, exactly how she was received okay. in, uh, in in Durham. Mm -hmm. uh, what we do know is that there, that there was quite a, a battle to allow um, uh, women students in, in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, a petition was um, sent to Senate in 1885, but it wasn't until um, 1895. That, um, that, the f that female students were allowed to take degrees. Um, Martha is interesting because after she matriculated, um, we find that in uh, February 1897, five, five women matriculated. So she was a sort of pioneer. Amazing. Yeah. And so am I correct in thinking that um, the Durham Archives have all of the matriculars from the entire history of the university? Is that correct? That, that is correct. Um, right from the, the early days of, of, of the university in 1832 um, and, in fact, almost up to the present day. Mm -hmm. Although the present uh, matricula is, is in um, the ceremonies unit because it's still, still being used. <laughs> Fantastic. So for our third uh, manuscript to look at, we are looking at a print of Codrington College in Barbados, which was associated for a time with the university. Um, now, do we have any idea when this was from? Uh, we don't have a precise date of when this was, was uh, published, but um, we think it, it, it was probably around 1830. Um, so Codrington College was, was um, um, founded in, in 1745. Um, Christopher Codrington was responsible for the donation. Um, he bequeathed it in his, in his will. And his original idea was that it was um, to be used for the benefits of the Afro-Caribbean population. Um, it, unfortunately, that was ignored and it continued to be a slave plantation right up until the, the abolition of slavery in 1833. Um, Durham's affiliation um, with Codrington College came into effect in, from 1875. Um, so a person from Barbados could take a degree at Codrington College and effectively um, obtain a Durham degree um, in, in, uh, in, as a result. Um, so it, um, that affiliation lasted from, from 1875 to, to 1965 when Codrington College became independent and uh, attached to the University of the West Indies, which it still is today. Amazing. Well, wow. And so, given that it was a sugar um, plantation, how are the Durham Archives looking further into slavery? Yeah, I mean, obviously the affiliation with Codrington College happened much later, a much later period in the 19th century than uh, well after the abolition of slavery. Um, but there was a missionary focus, so the idea was that the university was very, very much into missionary work in the late 19th century which reflected the kind of colonial aspect of, of the empire more generally. Um, but part of, part of my, my role as university archivist is to look into the, uh, is to do research into the history of the university and, and its links with, with slavery or income derived from slavery and also its links with colonialism um, and this is very much a part of that story. Okay. Jonathan, thank you very much. That's been fantastic talking to you. Thank you. So that's all from us at PAL TV today. We hope that you enjoyed this little look into Durham's history and please don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. We'll see you in the next video. Thank you for watching.